Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today evening. And today I'll speak on the topic of does God know our future? In the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says in the seventh chapter, Vedaham Samati Tani Vartamanancha Arjuna Bhavishani Chabhutani Mam to Vedana Krishna. He says that I know everything, past, present, and future, but me, no one knows. Now, if God knows the future, uh, obvious problem that comes is that, can you say, what do you think, does God know the future? Yes. Okay. It's very difficult to say that God does not know something, isn't it? <laughs> Obviously, how can you say that? But what is the problem if you say God knows the future? Yeah? Maybe we don't have free will. Yeah, we don't have free will. So, when Krishna says, I know the future, what does he actually mean? And if we see the Bhagavad Gita itself, which it says that I know the future, it also says that Arjuna, if you do this, this will happen. Machitta Saradargani Matprasada Atarishasi. Atachetta Mahankara Nashoshasi Vinashasi. Basically, Krishna gives choices. If you do this, this will happen. If you become conscious of me, you will pass over all obstacles. But if you don't become conscious of me, if you act out of ego, then you will be lost. So Krishna is clearly telling that there are choices and there are consequences. And the whole purpose of the Bhagavad Gita is to get, Ar to get Arjuna to make a right choice. And even at the end of the Gita, Krishna acknowledges that Arjuna, now it is up to you to choose. Now do as you desire. So do as you desire means and Krishna is telling Arjuna that you have free will. So, otherwise, what is the point of Krishna saying that you don't have that you do as you desire? In fact, if we say that we don't have free will, then the whole purpose of that being scripture itself becomes pointless. The scripture tells us this is Balde Vidyavish's argument in Vedanta Sutra that it says that scripture tells us do this and don't do this. But why would we tell that to anyone? If they were completely bound, if they were enslaved, if they had no free will, then what is the point in saying do this and don't do this? So here, there has to be a fundamental understanding with which we have to begin. That God is not a person like us. God, see most people, Often when they come to a temple and they see the form of God, they have a problem with that because they think the form is limited. And many times people try to solve this problem that, okay, God is limited. But they try to solve the problem of the limitedness of God by depersonalizing. That, oh, God cannot be limited. We are all persons. Say right now, I am present here. I cannot be present in Toronto. Or I cannot be present in India. So we as persons are limited. So if God is a person, then he also will be limited. That's the idea which most people have. So now, how can, so when people say that if God is a person, he is limited, therefore, let, therefore God has to be impersonal. But impersonal becomes less than personal. Isn't it? Impersonal means that God does not have a personality. God does not have a form. He becomes less than personal. And God cannot be less than us. God in every way has to be more than us. So there are, whenever we function in life, there are certain conceptions with which we function. So those conceptions themselves have to be questioned. Let's uh, give a couple of examples to illustrate this. That firstly, if we consider if we are drawing, if we have a point, and if you draw a line with that point, you draw a line from that point. Now, in one dimensional space, all that we can have is a set of lines. If we want to draw any shape in one dimension, the only shape we can draw is a line. But if you go into two dimensions, then we can draw angles. We can draw a right angle, we can draw a obtuse angle. 
These we can draw only when we move into two dimensions. So when we are in one dimension, what we can do itself is limited. If we draw a square in two dimensions, but we cannot draw objects in their reality. We can draw a circle in two dimensions. We cannot draw a sphere in two dimensions. To draw a sphere, we need to come to three dimensions. So basically, what we can do, we understand physically. If you have only one dimension, you can't draw a circle or a sphere, definitely. So we are limited in what we can do by the dimension we are functioning. So when we try to understand God, there are two ways of understanding Him. One is the bottom-up approach, where we try to understand Him by extrapolating from ourselves. Okay, I do like this, so God must be doing like this. The other is, so we could call this as the approach of extrapolation. We move from ourselves, but there is the approach of revelation. But this is what God is and He reveals Himself. Now, another example to illustrate this point further. So this is a broad understanding that God exists at a dimension higher than us. And because he exists at a higher dimension, he is not limited by the way we are limited. Now what does it mean? That God does not exist in time. He exists beyond time. Now what does exist beyond time mean? Specifically, it basically means that he exists. If we consider, I talk about this life in one dimension. So we think of, if we consider, think of time. This is the past. This is the present. This is the future. Okay. Now, in the past, present, and future, there is movement. So if God were existing at any particular point, then the result would be that he would have a past, he would have a present, and he would have a future. But if God exists outside time, then for him, past, present and future are these things which he observes. And he is present in all of them. He is present in all of them. What do I mean? Let's give to his present. To understand time, let's understand space first. Then understand time becomes easier. Okay, basically, let me give the conclusion. Does God know the future? So, the answer is, God's knowledge of the future is like our knowledge of the past. I repeat, God's knowledge of the future is like our knowledge of the past. What is our knowledge of the past? We know it, but we can't intervene and change it. Say, today, uh, today in the morning, I wanted to wake up early, but we woke up late. We know, I could have woken up at this time, but I woke up at this time. We can't change it. Now, if the God, it's not that he can't change, but he doesn't change. So it is, it is knowledge without intervention. It is knowledge, it is information, you could say information without intervention. God's knowledge of the future is like our knowledge of the past. It is information without intervention. Now, what does it mean, information without intervention? It simply means that he is not involved in the process of past, present, and future. He is outside it. And that's why he can simply observe udasina udasina. He can observe as if detached. He is detached in what sense? That he is not involved in the complications. Of whatever happens. Let's take another example to illustrate this. If we consider space, now if somebody, as I said, that if we want to go from here to here, in one dimension we'll have to go like this and then like this. You go by the lengthwise and then you go lengthwise. But if we have two dimensions, you could just go like this. So if you wanted to go here, if we had say a three-dimensional space over here, so we would have to go like this, like this, like this, and then like this. Hmm? Length, breadth, and then height. But if you draw a diagonal, 
then the distance would decrease. So now that means the distance between two points depends not just on the physical, how far they are, but how many dimensions separate them. So, if there are, if we are functioning in one dimension, the distance will be, say, if this is one and a half feet, this is one and a half feet, this is whatever it is, it will be three times the distance, A, B, A plus B plus C. But if we are going to draw a diagonal, it will be much less. So, just as the distance between two points decreases, as the dimensions available to us increase. Similarly for Krishna, he exists with access to infinite dimensions. And that's why he can be present with everyone at the same time. He can be present in your heart and he can be present in my heart. At the same time. So God's omnipresence means that he is equally available to every one of us. That he, suppose some people ask, say, we often say we pray to God and then God helps us. So, if we pray to God, some people may ask, okay, thousands of people are praying to God at the same time. So, does God have a parallel processing brain by which he can attend to all the prayers? Or is it that he attends one prayer and neglects other prayers? No. God doesn't exist in a level of reality like us. Let's take another example, that of a novel. If somebody is writing a novel, and the author is writing a novel, now the author may decide that, okay, this character is at his home, and now he can go to the office, he can go to a park, he can go well, turn on a TV at home, or he can call a friend. All these options are there. And for the character, that decision may have, is just one movement to next moment. For the character, okay, you can open the door and take a car and move this way, take a car and move this way, take a car, uh, or not open the door. That decision may happen within moments. For the author, who is writing the script of the character, writing the plot, the author may spend hours thinking about what plot twist to have. And the author spends hours deciding the plot twist. That means the author is available for hours and hours for that character to decide what the character is going to do. And now, while that author says oh, that that particular character is a hero and is a heroine, now the heroine may also be deciding, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And she also has to decide among various options. And her decision will also be in a split second, in a few moments, not a split second. But when the author is going to decide that, the author is available for each character to make each decision for as much time as needed. There are 10 characters and 10 characters acting in the, in the novel. Each character, the author, is available in the character. Now we may say, but actually, in the case of the author, the author is actually deciding what the characters do. But in our case, it is not God who is deciding, it is we who are deciding. We have free will. Yes, that is an additional twist, which can be understood when we try to write something, now anybody who becomes an author and writes something, they soon realize that the characters have a mind of their own. Why is the famous author who said that, actually, how do you write novels? He said, the characters appear to me and I just follow them and note down what they are. That means that there is a, when the author is writing, there is both spontaneity and, and deliberation. There is something which is deliberately, consciously decided and something which is spontaneous. So things like this. Like this. I, so, similarly for us, with respect to Krishna, 
Krishna exists beyond the level of reality which we exist at. So the example of the novel, if we consider that simply for this point, that the author exists at a different level of reality from the characters in the novel. And therefore, the author can give as much thought and time as is required for each character without interrupting or slowing down the flow of the plot. Similarly, Krishna is equally available for each one of us without he being overtaxed. Oh, so many people are calling it. Krishna, he has, he says he has the capacity to expand in space. Similarly, he has the capacity to expand in time. So when he expands, let, let's all if all these things are abstract, let's look at a story to understand this. In the Mahabharat, when the Pandavas finish their 12 years of exile, first in the forest, and then one year in Pavanita. After that, they are at the kingdom of Virat, and then the king, the king of Virat, he offers, uh, he offers, the right because Arjuna and the Pandavas have protected him from the attack of the Kauravas. So he offers Arjuna his daughter in marriage. And Arjuna says, no, I was a Brahanalla, her dance teacher. So I won't marry her. Let her marry my son. So then she marries Abhimanyu. And then it's a celebration. So at that time, both the Pandavas have finished their exile and there's a marriage in the family, there's a wedding. So various well-wishers and kings come over there. So Drupada also, who is the father of Draupadi, comes over there. And then they begin the process of negotiating peacefully to get the kingdom back. So Drupada sends his Brahmana priest uh, to after the consulting with the Pandavas and he gives a firmly worded, strongly worded message. He says the Pandavas have honored their part of the commitment now. Now, please give that kingdom back to them. And Dhritarashtra hears silently and he says, I'll send by my send back my reply soon and I'll send it with Sanjay, my messenger. So when Sanjay goes, Dhritarashtra gives him a very clever message. Dhritarashtra thinks, is there any way I can keep the kingdom and I can keep the peace. So he says, Oh Pandavas, all of you are virtuous. And you know the way of virtuous people. He says, all of us, we are engaged in this world and we have to renounce the world. So eventually, everybody has to take Vanaprastha. You are so fortunate that you are already Vanaprastha. So, why do you want to get back to the household way of life now? Why do you want to fight against your relatives to get a kingdom which you will renounce eventually? So you already Vanaprastha, continue to be Vanaprastha and continue to be in the retired order of life and progress spiritually. I wish you all good wishes. I offer you all my good wishes. So now, this is a sneaky argument. There is something, you know, there is one way if there is somebody shooting, somebody shooting and they have to hit a target. Now it's not easy to take aim and be able to hit the target. So some people, what they do is, they shoot first and wherever they hit, they say that was my target. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nitrashtra was like that in this case. What was Nitrashtra doing? He was somehow trying to sneak some way by which he could keep the kingdom. So now Yudhishthira replies that when O Sanjay did we say that we want to fight a war? Because we only want to do our dharma. And there are different dharmas at different times. Because we still have our dharma to our ancestors. So we have to begin progeny and continue our lineage. Continue our line. We have dharma to our citizens. We have to protect them and serve them as their protectors and kings. So for doing our dharma, we need a king. That is the dharma of Kshatriyas. So therefore, he says that we are fully ready to live in peace with you. 
or we have no desire for war. We are not bent on war. It is only those who stop us from doing our dharma that they are bent on war. So then, when Sanjay goes back with, with, the, with his reply, then after that, the next thing that happens is, Vitrasha uh, realizes that there is not going to be, he is not going to be able to keep the kingdom, but he refuses to reply. He doesn't, he doesn't answer at all. Then Krishna says that I will go as a peace messenger. When Krishna goes as a peace messenger, it's extraordinary. Why is it extraordinary? Because Krishna is known by everyone that he is the most powerful person. He has, has brought down demons who had terrorized the whole world. Demons like Kamsa. So Krishna going as a peace messenger is like say there is a conflict between India and Pakistan. Then maybe the Indian Secretary of State or somebody goes to meet the Pakistan Secretary of State and they try to have some discussion to resolve the tension and have peace. But suppose the Indian Prime Minister goes for petitioning for peace. Then the position of the person who is going with the proposal also matters. If somebody has a party at their house, somebody has some program at their house, and then they send us an invitation, they call us and tell us to come, or they send an invitation to someone else, or they themselves come to invite us, uh, then it who is inviting or who is proposing also matters. Position. So when Krishna comes, he says, it's a long story, I won't go into the full story, but he, he stayed at the house of Vidura. And Vidura is agonized. He's thinking that now already Duryodhana has planned and he said that when Krishna comes, if he, we will win him over by giving him a lot of comforts, a lot of luxuries. We'll offer him such honor that he'll be overwhelmed. And we will win him over to our side. And if we can't win him over to our side, then what we will do? We will arrest him. When Bhishma hears this, he talks about his proposal. He says, This is outrageous. He said, The peace and war is never to be arrested. And on top of that, what harm has Kesha done to you ever? He said, To even consider arresting him is sinful beyond words. You will never succeed because Kesha is all powerful. But even trying it will condemn you. And Bhishma gets so angry, he walks out of the assembly. But the news spreads. And Vitura is tormented by the thought. He said, the same assembly where Draupadi had been so grievously dishonored. In that same assembly, Krishna is going. And Krishna may also be dishonored over there. So I cannot tolerate this. How much dishonor can I tolerate of those whom I respect? I'm thinking like this, he approaches Krishna and he says, Krishna, you, why have you come for this peace proposal? Krishna, you know that the Pandavas, that the Kauravas are not going to accept your peace proposal. You know that they are not going to listen. Then, why have you come here? So Krishna says, Oh, Vidya, I also know that Duryodhana is adamant. Guru Dhanai is stubborn and he is not going to listen to the peace purpose. But I want to make sure that nobody blames my devotees for causing them. So I want to show the world that the Pandavas did everything possible to avoid war. Sometimes you may say that I have done everything humanly possible. The Pandavas did everything humanly possible and everything divinely possible also. Krishna is God himself and he came on the way. So now, when Krishna proposes peace, at that time he used Sam, Dham, Ved and Dhan. He initially, Sam, Dham, Ved and Dhan are four ways of negotiation. First is, Sam means reconciliation. Actually both of us have common interests. So, by the, that, that way, I to avoid the one. He says, actually, Pandas and Kauravas are all part of the same family. Yes, he says to the Dhrashtra, that if you have the Pandavas as your protectors, nobody will ever dare to threaten you. 
and the Guru kingdom that has existed for so long, flourishing, will continue for a long, long time to come. And Dhritarashtra hears and says, Okay, Shiva, whatever you say, I fully accept it. He says, I have no desire for you. But my son doesn't listen to me. So please speak to him. Dhritarashtra basically washes off his hands. It's like sometimes in some countries, there is, uh, there is a, there is in, in India also it happened before, five years before that. There was one person in the chair, there was another person in power. There was a remote control head on the street. So like that, the Trashtra was on the throne, but Duryodhana was in power. And then, he, after that, addresses Duryodhana. So, Sam, Sam means reconciliation. Then, Sam, Dham, Bhed, and Tanta. So then, Krishna turns to Duryodhana and starts speaking. And he says, Oh Duryodhana, you, if you have the Pantavas as your brothers, as your cousins, your friends, the kingdom that you have, nobody will dare to threaten that kingdom. You can enjoy prosperity over your kingdom if you view the Pantavas their kingdom. And Duryodhana doesn't listen to this. Then, Krishna tells him that, then the uses. He says that if you don't give the Pandavas their kingdom, Bhima will destroy you and he will destroy all your brothers. He has been waiting for 13 years to end his anger. And do not think he will be able to stop you. You have confidence in karma. But Arjuna has single-handedly defeated all of you just recently. You have this your whole, all of you will be destroyed. At that time, Arjuna, uh, on Krishna speaks so I just give very briefly the argument. Krishna speaks so persuasively that even Dushasan temp temporarily becomes overwhelmed. And Dushasan says, Yes, Yorudana should agree to peace. And if he does not, then we will all arrest him, tie him up, and hand him over to Krishna. Krishna gets furious. But then, somehow Krishna brings Dushyatana back over again. And then Krishna uses Asam, Dham, and then Bhe. So he uses Dham. He says, actually, if you want the kingdom, you keep the kingdom. Just give five minutes to And then, when he says, now with that also. So Krishna actually creates Bhed. Bhed means, initially what happened? Duryodhana and Dushasana were together. But Krishna creates a dissension. By, by presenting things so reasonably, Dushasana starts coming on Krishna's side. But Duryodhana walks out of there. When Duryodhana walks out, then at that time, Dushasana is there, and other Pandava, Kauravas are there. So other 98 Kauravas look at Duryodhana, look at Dushasana. Duryodhana has always been their leader. And one by one, they all also walk out. And Dushasana left all alone. Dushasana also walks up. Dushasana is very embarrassed now. And Duryodhana is so intelligent. Duryodhana says, he is talking with his brothers. He says, Krishna is very cunning. He can, he can manipulate the minds of anyone. And Dushasana peeks him. And Duryodhana is nonchalant. He says, isn't it? Yes, Duryodhana is, Krishna is so cunning that he can manipulate anyone's mind. He has just manipulated your mind, isn't it? Krishna is very cunning. So what Duryodhana does is, he gets Duryodhana off, Dushasana off the hook by telling him that it's Krishna is cunning. He does not say, he does not hold him as well. How dare you go against me? So anyway, then Sam, Dham, Bhed and Dhand. Now all of them flee. Then Krishna offers five villages. He says, just give five villages. What does Duryodhana reply? Duryodhana says, I will not give enough land to put even the tip of a needle through. To put of a tip of a needle through. Now, what does this mean, this imply? There are different ways of saying no. Sometimes if we invite someone for a program and they say, actually, I'm busy, so I can't come to you. I have got this disengagement. That says no to the request. It is not, the, no, not no to the requester. But if somebody says, if we invite them for a program and they say that, even if I die, my dead body will not come to your program. 
that is not no to the request, that is like a banging no to the person itself. So Duryodhana's no is like this. He says, I will not give you enough water, enough land to put it on the tip of a needle. That means I am not interested in the reconciliation at all. Then he tries to arrest Krishna, because Krishna shows the wish you. And Duryodhana's plan is perfect. And then Krishna laughing departs from there. And he says to Duryodhana, all of you have seen how obstinate this wretched prince is. And he is doomed. And all those who support him will also be doomed. So, in a sense, what Krishna has said happens. Duryodhana is not going to listen to him. Duryodhana is not going to accept the peace purpose. So then, if Krishna knows the future, then why did Krishna go as a peace proposal, with a peace proposal? That is because of his love for the Pandavas. So this brings us to the most important point. I give some examples of how Krishna pervades space and pervades time. Hmm. Pervades space because he exists in unlimited dimensions. And thus every point is equally accessible to him. And like a novel writer, he is available for each character to make every decision. But the most important thing when we are uh, trying to understand Krishna is that Krishna is omniscient, Krishna is omnipotent. But he is not stuck with either of them. The so Metis argue that actually there is a problem in the defining characters to some God itself. That if you say God is omniscient, that means he knows the future. He knows everything. And God is omnipotent. That means he can do everything. So if God knows everything, then he knows the future also. But if he knows the future, then can he change the future? If he can change the future, then does he know the future? So they argue that God's omniscience and God's omnipotence, they are contradictory. That if God can know the future, then he can't change the future. That means he can't do any of it. And if he can do everything, then he can't know the future. So actually, to understand this, reconcile this, the important thing is to understand that God is not just omnipotent or omniscient. God is omnibenevolent. Omnibenevolent means he is supremely loving. What, why, why is it relevant to say that he is supremely loving? That means that God is not stuck with any of his attributes. Some people may be extremely tall. Now, being very tall, that height has an advantage. You can see, see much further than what other people can see. But suppose there's a door which is, has a low roof ceiling. Then, they're stuck with their height. They can bump their head, they have to go down and come. So, somebody has an attribute of being very tall, then they're stuck with their height. But Krishna is not like that. Krishna is omniscient, but he is not stuck with his omniscience. Say, in this month we celebrate the Damodar Leela. So when Krishna steals butter and breaks the butter pot and runs away, and then Krishna is giving some butter to the monkeys. When he is giving butter to the monkeys, he is looking behind. Now Yashoda is coming, Yashoda is coming, looking here, looking there. Give me a little more butter. I'm looking here, I'm giving me butter. Now Mother Yashoda comes right from behind. She actually is from this side, she comes and she says, Krishna is there. She says, I do. She looks from there and she comes right from behind Krishna. She comes from behind Krishna and that time Krishna looks from here, looks, doesn't notice it. And then he's feeding butter to the monkeys and the monkeys see. The monkeys get scared. And as soon as the monkeys get scared, Krishna looks at, them, looks at his mother and jumps down and starts running. Now, as soon as Krishna starts running, he is running frantically. Oh, my mother is angry with me. She will punish me. I have to run for my life. At that time, does Krishna know that, oh, my mother is going to catch me and then she is going to tie me up and then she is not able to tie me up and then she will get more ropes and then finally, after great effort, she will tie me up. So, does Krishna know all this? The point of the Leela is not knowing the point of the Leela is relation. It's a very important point to understand. 
the whole purpose of the leela is not just to know what happens the whole purpose of the leela is to relish what happens so krishna he actually is god but he delights not in his godhood i am god i know everything he delights in the reciprocation of love and because he delights in the reciprocation of love by the arrangement of yoga maya his knowledge becomes temporarily covered by his own will so that when he is reciprocating love with his devotees at that time no, no one he it's almost as if he forgets he doesn't forget but it's as if he forgets so that he can reciprocate love with his devotees so going back to the earlier example of script writer i talked about it say krishna leela is like a drama in the drama there is a director and for the drama to be enjoyed by the artist what it is that each character each actor enter into the character and krishna is performing his leela which is like a eternal drama then when krishna plays the role of a small child he enters into that role unless somebody enters into a particular role they cannot actually enact it that way so that to, to for them to enjoy those and they enjoy the role of their character and for the audience to enjoy there has to be immersion Once the audience will not be immersed so the actor's immersion is vital so what happens is krishna is the actor and yoga maya is the director so yoga maya says yoga maya arranges okay this is what happens this is what this is what and the is a director directs and all the actors act accordingly now if you consider in most movies the hero or the heroine are far far more well known and they much much wealthier also than the directors but in the movie the hero and the heroine act according to the director but is a further twist is the director doesn't just direct arbitrary the director directs according to a script the script writer provides the overall narrative the script and the director directs according to the script so in krishna leela krishna is the actor yoga maya is the director and krishna is the script writer so krishna is krishna is controlled by yoga maya but yoga maya is controlled by krishna so in this way in krishna leela there is a chin krishna is not in control and krishna is also in control krishna is in control because he is the script writer and everything is happening according to his script but krishna is not in control because as a as a play as an actor in the drama he has entered into the character so when krishna is running away from his mother he is actually running for his life and my mother is so angry i have done so much mischief she will punish me oh no no i cannot be caught. i cannot afford to be caught i have to run krishna runs for his life <clears throat> so be a pian bhayati that lord from whom fear runs that lord runs in fear of his mother that is the wonder of krishna as god so krishna now now this dynamic so krishna as god he always remains god but his divinity is never challenged nobody else can assert his position as god at the same time for the purpose of leela he chooses to subordinate himself to yoga and what is the purpose of leela the purpose of leela is reciprocation of love if yashoda mai knows that actually krishna is god and whatever i am giving krishna it is krishna only who is given me then there will be no reciprocation of love with that can only one way relationship oh god you are so great i bow down to you but if there is multi if there are multifarious relationship that are to be had then krishna takes on the role that is required for it so now going back to the point here does krishna know the future in his leela yes he knows but the point is not knowing the point is relation and for relishing yoga maya acts in such a way 
that Krishna forgets. Krishna forgets. So when Krishna, when he is running away from Yoga Maya, he is entered into the character of a child who is, after doing mischief, running from his mother. Now let's bring this down to the pastime which we just discussed. When Krishna goes as Shanti Dut, as the messenger of peace to the Kauravas. At that time, Krishna, in a sense, knows what is going to happen. But Krishna, his purpose is not just to control what happens. His purpose is to reciprocate love. His purpose is what? To reciprocate love. And thus, out of his love for his Pandavas, he goes to the Kauravas. And he petitions for peace. And when he is petitioning for peace, at that time he is not thinking, Oh, Duryodhana is not going to listen. Why should I do all this? And Krishna focuses on, How can I best express my love for my devotees? And thus, he does his best. And normally nobody likes to fail. If somebody is gone for an expedition, somebody is gone for a mission, Nobody likes to say that, oh, I failed on this mission. So Krishna goes on the mission for peace and he fails. Now, we all fail sometimes in our lives. Because factors beyond our control, they just work in a particular way that we can't do anything. Now, can God fail? God is omnipotent, isn't it? Yes, God is omnipotent. But, this is a very important point. God is the supreme controller but he is not the sole controller. God is the supreme controller. He is the Parameshwara. But by his arrangement, he has made others also Ishwara. There are various other devatas who have their powers. So God is the supreme controller, but he is not the sole controller. He has given every soul free will. And based on that free will, that soul can act in different ways. And when that soul acts according to free will, each soul, by their past karma, has been given a kshetra. Kshetra is the area of influence or the area of control, more precisely. So, Duryodhana, by his past karma, had been given the area of control that he is a prince and he has princely power. Now, with that princely power, what he will do, that is not what Krishna decides. That is what Duryodhana is, Duryodhana decides. So this means that Krishna does not control everything. I'll give another example to illustrate this. In the Bhagavad Gita itself, the example is given. Itha kash sito nityam vayu sarvatra go mahan itha sarvani mutani matsthani tyopadhalaya As all living beings exist just as the wind moves in the sky, the sky controls the area of movement of the wind. The sky doesn't control the specific movement of the wind. Whether the wind moves left or right or up or down, the, wind, the sky doesn't control that. Similarly, Krishna says, all living beings reside in me. It means they act within the purview of my will. But I don't control which way they are. Do like this, do like this, do like this, do like this. So that means Krishna is, again going back to the example that for, for us this was the past, this is the present, this is the future. But for Krishna, he exists outside the time domain. Because he exists outside the time domain, so there is no conception of past, present or future for him. And because there is no conception of past, present or future for him, so therefore, existing outside the time domain, he can observe and he can know the future without our being deprived of freedom. Okay, let's uh, another example. Right now, we are free. So each of us, say I have spoken one sentence and I can speak some other sentence. I choose to speak a particular sentence. While sitting, you can hear particular sentence, you can say, okay, I'm interested. This is too difficult to understand. I can't focus so much. You might decide to think of something else. 
or you may decide to focus. So now, is your action free? Freely chosen? Yes. Right? You can choose to pay attention or not pay attention. So, Krishna knows the present and still that doesn't impede your free will or our free will to choose the present. Similarly, Krishna knows the future but that doesn't impede our free will to choose the future. I'll give two more examples and then I'll open for questions. If we consider somebody has made a map, say GPS has got the whole world map up. Now, on if there is a particular path, it takes say, if you turn this way, you go to this city. If you turn this way, you go to this city. If you turn this way, you go to this city. So now there are different paths which lead to different destinations. But then, if a person who has made the map, that person is observing, you know, if people take this road, now at this turn, the three, three roads are there. Road, 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 road. It takes the road, this road they'll go here, this road they'll go here, this road they'll go here. So this can't be changed. If you take a particular road, you're going to go to a particular destination. So in that sense, if you consider that which cause will lead to which consequence, which action which will lead to which destination, that the person who is driving, if they don't have a map, they don't know it. But the person who has made the map and who is aware of the map, they know it. So now, if you take this further to the point where we understand that this is not just a, this is the map is spreading out, is describing territory that has spread out in space. The territory that has spread out in space. And for a person who is traveling on the on a journey, they are at a particular point. And there is, okay, this was where I was in the past, this is where I'm going to go in the future. But, there are different paths and each path will lead to a particular destination. For them, they have not yet reached the destination. But others, for some, for the map maker, they know which path leads to which destination. So similarly for us, you know, if we, what applies to a map in space, we can try to visualize a map in time. A map in space refers to Territory being mapped out. This part, this destination. This part, this decision. Now, similarly, if you could have a map in time, not just in space, and this territory leads to this destination. This territory leads to this destination. And that way, if we move forwards, then we understand that Krishna can know past, present, and future, but he will not intervene. Now, ultimately, what is the purpose of knowing about Krishna? There is a verse in the Bhagavad Gita, in the Upikena Upanishad, which says that one who thinks he knows does not know. And one who knows he does not know, knows. That means ultimately God is unknown. The purpose of knowing God is not just to know God, it is to love God. And if you understand this, the way to approach Krishna is so that you can love him. The purpose of knowing Krishna is not to know Krishna in full. You can never know Krishna in full. It says somebody is a geologist and they want to study the earth. They want to study some particular rocks which are there in the rocky mountains. Then they go there, the rocks won't come to them. They go there and they study the rocks, the rocks stay there as it is. So in this case, all the initiative has to come from the person who wants to study. Now instead of a geologist, they consider somebody the zoologist. And they want to study, say, pandas in the wilderness. They want to study animals in the wilderness. Now in the case of animals, the zoologist has to go to the animal. But the animal can go away. So in that case, it's the initiative has to come from the zoologist, but there has to be some kind of sanction or reciprocation from the object of study. Without that sanction, the animals run away. They can't study. We say that I'll catch the animal, I'll kill the animal, I'll study the animal. 
Well, that's dead. What are they going to study over? So you, if you want to study the animals in their habitat, in the wilderness, then they have to cooperate. Now take this further ahead. And suppose you want to meet some very big person. If somebody wants to meet the president of the head of state of Canada, president of America, the prime minister of India, somebody wants to meet. Then in that case, so in the case of the zoologist, the zoologist has to go there and the animal has to also cooperate. In the case of a person who is bigger than us, at that time, it's not just we have to go, if that person has to take initiative. So unless there will be thousands of people who want to meet the head of state. So the initiative may have to come from us, but the major part in meeting has to come from them. Now if you take this further higher up, that in the case of Krishna, he is a supreme, he is far far greater than any head of state. And if we are to connect with him, Certainly, a citizen has to take the initiative to try to meet the head of the state. But it is, there is a citizen's initiative and there is the head of the state's prerogative. Prerogative means a privilege, the right, whether I want to meet or not. I have a hundred things to do, I can't meet. So similarly, there is the prerogative of the supreme being. Now, it's interesting that Krishna speaks this verse just after speaking the previous verse. That is, Maham Prakash Sarvasya Yoga Maya Samavritaha Maham Prakash Sarvasya I am not known to everyone. Yoga Maya Samavritaha I am covered over by Yoga Maya. Moodhoyam Abhijanati Those who are deluded do not know me. So here the point is that for us our purpose is we know Krishna so that we love Krishna. Just as in Krishna Leela. The point is not just knowing what is going to happen. The point is to relish what is happening. Similarly, whether Krishna knows our future or not. What is important is Krishna loves us. And if we choose to love him, then our future is always bright. We can't know what the future holds. But we know who holds the future. We know who holds the future. Krishna is with us in the future also. Krishna was with us in the past. Krishna is with us in the present. And Krishna will be with us in the future. And with this understanding, in every situation, rather than thinking, oh, does Krishna know what is going to happen? Is this going to happen? Is that going to happen? Focus on how best can I serve Krishna in this situation. Krishna, you are my Lord. I am your servant. Krishna and the soul. Please guide me. How can I say? We have this moon that we find that whatever the future holds, good or bad, Krishna will take us through the good and through the bad ultimately to him who is the best. Krishna tells Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita that Mayai Vaite Nihataha Purumeva. By my arrangement, all the opponents are killed. And Prabhupada says that then Krishna, Arjuna doesn't tell Krishna, Krishna, you already killed the opponent, then why should I fight the war? No. Krishna says, Arjuna says that I will fight to glorify you. So, and that's what Krishna also tells us. Nimitta matram bhavasavadisaji. Become my instrument. And that is what Arjuna does. And that's how Arjuna becomes glorified as the person who brought down the foremost warriors on the opposite side. And Krishna gives Arjuna the credit. The Bhagavad Gita concludes with Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna Yatra Patha Dhanudhara Tatra Shri Vijay Yogutti Dhruva Nitir Atirama. Wherever there is Krishna, wherever there is Arjuna, there will be victory, there will be opulence, there will be power, there will be morality. So it's interesting that now why does Krishna, why does Krishna that last verse, have to include Arjuna? You could say, wherever there is Krishna, there is going to be victory. Wherever there is Krishna, there is going to be opulence. Wherever there is Krishna, there is going to be power. Isn't it? Krishna is the lord of the goddess of fortune. So wherever he is, all this is going to be there. So then why include Arjuna in the list? The purpose of the Gita 
is not just to glorify God's position. It's not just to proclaim God's position. The purpose of the Gita is to transform man's disposition. To transform, Arjuna was unwilling to fight initially and Arjuna became willing to fight at the end of the war. So, by Krishna's arrangement, the opponents were killed. But Arjuna had the freedom. And Krishna spoke the whole Bhagavad Gita so that Arjuna could use his free will and fight the war, win the war and gain the credit. So the whole point is not to know what will happen in the future. The whole point is to reciprocate love with Krishna as we move in the future. So Krishna, how can I love you? How can I serve you? How can I attain you, Krishna? So, if we keep that mood of love, just as Krishna keeps that mood of loving reciprocation in his pastimes, and thus he relishes those pastimes. So similarly, if we keep that mood, Krishna, I want to serve you. And Krishna will reveal to us that he is always with us. And that, in remembering him, in loving him, our future is always bright. And in that sense, a devotee also knows the future. We don't know what is going to happen at the material level. At the spiritual level, by our connection with Krishna, by our absorption Krishna, we can always be absorbed and thus we can tolerate and transcend life's ups and downs. So by focusing on Krishna, what happens? We get the confidence to move through life, whatever it sends our way. So I'll summarize. I spoke on the topic of, does Krishna know the future? I started by speaking that if Krishna knows the future, does it mean that we don't have free will? I said, no, Krishna knowledge of the future is like our knowledge of the past. It is information without intervention. Now, how does that information without intervention work out? I give examples that Krishna is not limited by space and time. Krishna exists outside space and time and therefore he, his existence is different from ours. So, in, a, in one dimensional space, to go from one particular distance to another distance will take some time. In two dimensional space, if to go from here till here, in three, one dimensional space will take three journeys. In three dimensional space it will take only one journey. So if we raise this to multiple dimensions, to infinite dimensions, then every point will be connected with the shortest distance with every other every other point. So Krishna is like that point. So Krishna is, is for us, space is all spread out. Because we exist in three-dimensional space. But Krishna exists in omnidimensional, in unlimited dimensions. So for him, the space that is spread out is all connected. And thus Krishna can pervade all of space. Krishna can be present in your heart, in my heart, and everyone's heart at the same time. So God's omniscience, God's omnipresence is relatively easy to accept because we accept the space is spread out and static. But his omniscience, his knowledge of the future becomes a little difficult to accept because there the free will comes in the picture. Then I talk about the author. Author, author writes the story of the characters. And then we offer prayers to Krishna. If 100 people are offering prayers to Krishna, Krishna doesn't have to do parallel processing to be with, at high speed to be with everyone. Krishna is personally with everyone. Just like an author is writing a novel, each character's decision that is taken, the character decision may be taken in a split moment, but the author is there to deliberate as long as is needed for the character to take a decision. Now it may appear that the our characters program, no. The characters have a life of their own. And Krishna is the supreme controller, but not the sole controller. So Krishna gives us free will, but free will within a limited jurisdiction. Just like the wind can move within the jurisdiction of the star. I talk about the Krishna going as Shanti Dut, the peace messenger, where Krishna knew the future that Duryodhana was not going to accept these people. And yet Krishna went. Why? To, to demonstrate his love for his devotees, the Pandavas, to demonstrate the world to the world. And the Pandavas did everything humanly possible and divinely possible to avoid war. And then I discussed the Damodar Leela briefly outlined that the, the point is not knowing what happens. 
not to know what happens. The point is to relish what happens. So Krishna is like the actor in a drama and Yoga Maya is the director. And then Krishna himself is the script writer. So that means Krishna is in, is in, not in control. When he enters into a particular role, he fully enters into it and forgets that he is God. But at the same time, whatever is happening is ultimately under his control. So similarly, when we want to act in life, at that time, rather than worrying too much about whether Krishna knows the future, does that mean I am not free? You see, the mood of the Bhagavad Gita is, Krishna tells Arjun, your enemies are killed. But then, you take up the initiative and fight. So similarly, we take up the initiative to serve Krishna. And if we strive to serve Krishna, to the best of our capacity, our future will always be bright. And Krishna will be with us in the past, in the present and the future at all times. Krishna is that Lord who pervades space and pervades time. And the whole purpose of approaching Krishna is not to know him. It is to love him. Krishna is not like a geologist subject of study or a zoologist subject of study or even a social activist subject of wanting to meet the head of state. Krishna is supreme. So our, our initiative to meet him is required, but it is his prerogative to whom he reveals himself. So what, to whom does he reveal himself? To those who approach him with love. So God's omniscience and his omni, omnipotence, they may seem contradictory, but they will be reconciled if you understand that God is not stuck with his attributes. All his attributes are in the service of his omnibenevolence, of his loving nature. And out of his love, he does everything. And when we approach him out of love, then we will experience his omnibenevolence and thus whatever the future holds for us. By focusing on the one who holds the future, we can face the future and grow to Krishna through the future. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Sufficiently confused? <laughs> <laughs> Any questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. So Krishna chooses whom he reveals himself to. So how to ensure that Krishna chooses us? There are two aspects to this. One is, when say Krishna chooses, does that mean that Krishna doesn't want to choose someone? That Krishna is Krishna is Krishna is reciprocal at the same time he's personal. But is, so, because he, he's personal, what does that mean? I'll explain this. Two examples. Once Prabhupada was on a morning walk and they were passed by a lake. And when they passed by the lake, at that time, there was a man who was feeding some crumbs to a duck. So, the ducks in the lake. And he was throwing some crumbs to the ducks and the ducks were coming forward and all of them were getting something. But there was one duck that was quacking especially loudly. And this man was feeling more to that duck. And Prabhupada said, this is how we should call to Krishna. The more we call to Krishna, the more he will, he will give us. Now here, we often say Krishna's mercy is causeless. So Krishna's mercy is causeless means what? Now that duck's quacking does not necessarily force the person to give the crumbs more. That person who is a donor is not bound to give more to somebody who approaches him. But 
the person who approaches more, the person who calls out more, that person is possibly likely to get more. So what is in the hands of the duck? Or in the, it's just to croak, to quack rather. So similarly, what is in our hand is to call out. And if we call out more and more, we show Krishna our desire that we want him. We want to attain his mercy. So Krishna will choose us. That's one way that our endeavor doesn't force Krishna, but our endeavor attracts Krishna. Having said this, the other point to understand is actually our endeavor is not so much to attract Krishna or our endeavor is more to open our heart to Krishna. Because Krishna, Krishna, as Prabhupada would say, Krishna wants us to come to him more than we want to come to him. But our heart is misdirected to many other things. And because of that, because of that misdirection, Krishna is not able to reveal himself to us. Say so a simple example. The sun gives light to everyone. But if somebody's eyes are closed, they can't see the light of the sun. They can't see in the light of the sun. So now at one level we could say, Krishna, please give me light, please give me light. The other level, Krishna has already given the light. As I only have to open my eyes. So for us, when we say Krishna has to choose us, it is rather, we could say, Buddha, that we have to let ourselves be chosen by Krishna. But Krishna already wants us to come to him. It is just that we have so many other desires that we are not ready to go to him. So in this second example, the stress is what? It is not so much on that. It's not that Krishna has some special mercy that he's holding on to and he doesn't want to be. It's not like that. Krishna wants to give mercy to everyone. But it's just we who are not able to connect with him because of our so many attachments that we are holding on. So if we just keep practicing bhakti, then by that, at one level, it, at one level we are calling out to Krishna, like the duck. Please give me more. Please give me bread. Please give me bread. Please give me some crops. At another level, our endeavor is, like as Bhakti Nathakur, the picture of the mouse, Jeeva Jago, Jeeva Jago. Just open the eyes, open the eyes to reality. So, when we open our eyes, we'll see Krishna is with us. So, we can only endeavor to the best of our capacity. But while endeavoring, we shouldn't think that Krishna is somehow uh, holding himself back. Rather, it is we who are holding ourselves back. So, if we just try to give ourselves to Krishna, Krishna will be himself. Any other questions? Yes, please. So we said uh, we have free will. Then uh, uh, we were saying that uh, without Krishna's uh, will, not even a blade of grass moves. So how do you okay. justify it? So if we say we have free will, but then without Krishna's will, not even a blade of grass moves. So how do you justify it? Do I have the freedom to not answer this question? <laughs> what do you think? Do I have the freedom? <laughs> the question is answered. <laughs> we all have freedom. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, if you see, there are many uh, popular or anecdotal, or you could say popular renditions of spiritual truths, which may not be as accurate as the actual spiritual truth. Uh, in Hindi, there is a, many people in their homes in India have something called Gita Sar. And the Gita Sar says, Jo hua wo achha hua. Jo ho raha hai wo achha hua. Jo hone wala hai wo bhi achha hai. Whatever happened was good. Whatever is happening is good. Whatever will happen will also be good. Uh, at one this is nice. It's is very soothing. I've been studying the Gita for more than 20 years. I've read the Gita hundreds of times. I've at least recited the Gita hundreds of times. But I read it also dozens and dozens of times. I have never found any words which comes even remotely close to this. Whatever has happened is good, whatever is happening is good, whatever will happen will be good. There's no words in the Gita. 
Okay. Now, is this not true? That whatever happens is good? See, the point here is that people have free will. And if by their free will they misuse it, at that time they do terrible things. So it is not that when people misuse their free will to do terrible things, it is, you can't say that that is God's will. If Dushasana is trying to disrobe Dropad, if Ravana is trying to abduct Sita, uh, does anyone in the Mahabharata or Ramayana tell them, Johua Vachau, whatever happened is good? No, we think that it's terrible, it's a catastrophe that it happened. So, I would say a more precise rendition, which is in harmony with scripture, in the Bhagavad Gita, Upadrashta Anumanta Cha. Third point of the Krishna says, I am the overseer and the permitter. So, Krishna doesn't say, I am the desirer of everything that happens. I am the overseer and the permitter of everything that happens. So, when Dushasana is trying to disrobe Draupadi, it is not that Krishna desire that Draupadi go through that song. It is Dushasana who misuses his free will to do that heinous activity. And Krishna, in that situation, allows him to do it. Why? Because he, by his past karma, has got a Kshatriya position, which is got some power. And he can misuse that power and he can use that power. So that's why a more precise rendition would be without God's sanction of things. So without God's will, not a blade of grass means what if we use that word will to mean sanction. That will doesn't mean intention. There's a difference. Everything that happens is with God's sanction. That's why I said God is a supreme control. But God is not a soul control. That means that it's not that it's his intention that everything that happens happens. If we start saying it's his intention, then all people who do all terrible things, you know, it, it's, they can say that okay, it's God's intention that we do it. Then, where will be free will? Where will be responsibility? What is the meaning of the law of karma? If person A goes and kills person B. And then it's actually God intention that you be killed. And that would make all systems of accountability collapse. So everything <laughs> that happens, not, not a blade of grass moves without God's sanction. Not that every movement of every blade of grass is God's intention. Okay? Yes. Yeah. Actually, do we really have a free will because uh, all the impulses which is coming is from the past karma? So that we are motivated by the past karma without even thinking, we just act. So, is it really free will? Free will means I will have to make a decision whether it's right or not right, I have a decision to do it. So, so we have impulses coming from past karma. That is karma. So, does that mean we still really have free will? See, our past impulses push us. They don't force us. We have the capacity to push back. In fact, that is the unique prerogative of, of the human body. The animals also have free will. But their free will is extremely circumscribed. Say, if a cat sees a mouse, the cat can't think. the <laughs> If the cat sees the mouse, it will bounce on it. Then the cat may have free will. Okay, there are two mice which come out of the hole. One goes this way, one goes this way. So which mice have to bounce on? You can choose that. When a cow eats grass, it finishes eating one line of grass. It can turn towards the left, it can turn towards the right. So it has free will. But its free will is extremely circumscribed. That means, the lower the species that somebody is in, the impulses govern them that much more. The higher the species one is in, the impulses push. But we also have intelligence to evaluate the impulses. And that evaluation of the impulses is what actually expands our free will. So we could say that our free will is not a fixed resource. If say somebody has a Somebody has says a million dollars and they put in the fixed deposit. Then it stays as it is. Increases or at least stays as it is. 
but they put it in the stock market. The stock market crashes. It's gone. So our free will is not like a static resource. We have free will, but based on how we use it, that free will can increase or decrease. So nobody is born, say, smoking a cigarette. But some people become so compulsive smokers. They just can't. Yes. I was at a hospital, there was a doctor who was treating a patient. And this patient had got lung cancer. He had to be operated. And that, that patient, just before going into surgery, said, I want to smoke a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> it is pathetic. <laughs> but, so what had happened? He had not been born smoking like that. But when we give in to an impulse again and again and again and again, that impulse gains more and more force. And then it becomes almost impossible to not choose it. Well, it's always possible. Say, if somebody is interested in movies and they have visited a particular website, say Bollywood.com, and then they come for a spiritual program and they hear about Bhagavad Gita. Oh, I want to know about Bhagavad Gita. Then they go and type on their Google Bhagavad Gita. And for that, they type B. And as soon as they type B, what happens? Bollywood.com <laughs> Bollywood. <laughs> comes <laughs> Now, why has Bollywood.com come? Because they have chosen it in the past. So, in this case, now Bollywood.com has come as an autocomplete. If they don't do anything, it will get completed. And Bollywood.com may open up. But if somebody has not chosen Bollywood.com at all, then they type B, nothing may come up. If somebody has already visited Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad.com many times, they type B, Bhagavad.com will come So, if you see in a computer, Based on past choices, certain autocomplete come up. But we can choose whether to let them get completed or not be completed. When something is not there as autocomplete, then we have to put an effort to complete it. When something comes as an autocomplete, then we don't have to put in any effort. But if something unwanted comes as autocomplete, then we have to put effort to cancel it. So similarly, with respect to our free will, Based on how we have acted in the past, uh, certain ideas, certain desires, certain actions, they come with autocompletes. And resisting them becomes, requires more and more. The free will is always there, but the scope of the free will can be decreased enormously. Some people may have free will, so somebody's alcohol. The only free will they have is not whether they can drink or not, they have, still have free will. Should have been three glasses or four glasses. <laughs> but that is also free. Nobody can say, I have no free will. So our free will can get limited by abuse and our free will can be expanded by proper use. And human being, our life has the opportunity for us to expand the resource of free will that we present here. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki. Gaurabhakta Vindaki. Gaurabhakta Vindaki.